Martin's colloquium series. Uh, today we dive into the 20th century with British modernism. And uh, so today it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Hagen. Dr. Hagen received his PhD at the University of Rhode Island in 2012, uh, which does make him something of a young whippersnapper. <laughs> so, Thanks, Skip. And my pal. Uh, he is currently in his second year of teaching at USD, although his first is a tenure track faculty member, and we are very lucky to have him here. He has spearheaded our theory reading group and his insights into Michelle Foucault, Judith Butler, and CNI, in addition to his expertise on views, uh, have really helped uh, digest this material. So a big thank you there for that service to us, and also a shameless plug for the theory reading group. <laughs> if you'd like to start coming or whatever, you can just contact Ben, myself, or Heather. Uh, Dr. Hagen has published his work in numerous places already, including 20th century literature, modernism, modernity, the James Joyce Quarterly, and the Explicator. His big publishing coup, however, is his forthcoming article in the spring 2017 uh, issue of PMLA, with an article entitled Fe uh, Feeling Shadows of Virginia Woolf's Sensuous Pedagogy. Uh, and I'm zooming that this is part of his current research. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, it is, yeah. awesome, which is uh, called Learn, Read, Love, the Essentials Pedagogies of Virginia Woolf and E.H. Lawrence. Today's lecture is entitled, I Will Continue, But Can I, British Modernism Between the Wars? So please join me in welcoming the man with the golden voice and the velvet throat, <laughs> <laughs> Ben Hagen. Well, thanks, Skip, for that amazing introduction. Um, it's probably the best one I've ever had. M amazing introduction. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I don't disappoint. Um, and thank you to those of you who've uh, chosen to come, and even to those of you who felt compelled to come and spend an hour uh, of your afternoon with me. As it should be clear from my title and subtitle, uh, many of the things I'll be talking about today are quite difficult, not just aesthetically, but also emotionally and psychically. Uh, so I hope uh, we're all prepared. The first half of my talk will address modernism, British modernism in general, uh, and the second half or uh, thereabouts will turn to the matters of my sub subtitle. By the wars, of course, I mean the world wars, World War I and World War II. So without further ado, part one, generalizing modernism. I want to clarify my use of this term modernism since there is, I think, an important difference between what we might call the generalist and the specialist senses of this word. We'll hear more about the latter next week in Dr. Love's colloquium lecture, but I, I want to point out that though the word specialist tends to connote, or rather denote, a narrowing or focusing of one's expertise, within the field of modernist studies, this identifying term modernism now constitutes an expanding category of writers, thinkers, texts, and archives that crosses and encompasses many arts, styles, politics, media, classes, readerships, discourses, languages, technologies, disciplines, nations, environments, regions, communities, and even time periods. The titles of the studies that I have up here, you might not be able to read them all, but uh, the general sort of relation between a lot of them is a sort of global term within modernist studies, sort of, sort of decentering Europe, England, and the United States as a sort of center of um, the study of modernism. But I think as next week, next week as Dr. Lovell show, even if one does focus on, for instance, the United States, we'll find that scholars for some time now have been pluralizing modernism into many, many, many modernisms. But that's next week. The word modernism in this lecture is quite generalist. I use it to refer to a traditional literary period that falls between the Victorian and the postmodern. This period begins around 1890 and ends around 1945, just short of the mid-century mark. According to per Pericles Lewis, the term modernism, at least in the English context, refers primarily to the tendency, this is a quote, of experimental literature of the early 20th century to break away from traditional verse forms, narrative techniques, and generic conventions in order to seek new methods of representation appropriate to life in an urban, industrial, mass-oriented age. 
I want to come back to this definition in just a, a few minutes because it touches on something that Dr. Dudley spoke about last week in his lecture on realism. The most recognizable writers of this period, <coughs> in, to my mind, are James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, and Virginia Woolf, who have typically been categorized as high modernists, meaning, depending on the context of the claim, the best, the most influential, the most important, or the most difficult. The Annus Moratilis for these three writers is 1922, the year that sees the publication of Wolfe's Jacob's Room, her first highly experimental novel, Joyce's Ulysses, and Eliot's The Wasteland. Other writers of the period include William Butler Yeats, Joseph Conrad, Ford Maddox Ford, D.H. Lawrence, Rebecca West, and Catherine Mansfield, among others. And all of them move in and out of this category of high modernism. But their work still fits neatly, I think, within this generalist sense of a literary period, since they share many of the same formal and thematic concerns and features of the more clearly uh, experimental writers. And this is not to say, I mean, several of these uh, authors, including Dorothy Richardson, certainly Samuel Beckett, um, uh, certainly Catherine Mansfield and Jean Reese, they write highly experimental work, but um, depending on what one is reading, it sort of moves in and out of being somewhat conventional or not. But coming back to Lewis's definition of modernism, we might ask, what distinguishes modernist literature from the literature of the 19th century? Although typical answers rely on words like difficulty, complexity, or obscurity, last week Dr. Dudley challenged such answers since they tend to imply that realism, the dominant mode of 19th century fiction writing, is by comparison simple, naive, and homogeneous. He showed us several instances, see what I did there? Right, good. Um, he showed us several instances, he's not even here, but anyway, he showed us several instances in which 19th century literature is subversive in its exposure of types and artifices too often taken as matters of fact or actuality. Realist portraits, you might recall him saying, are not what they seem. Perhaps a better way to mark a distinction then between realism and modernism would be to underscore a change in the attitude of writers toward their potential readers, rather than to reify a binary like simple, complex, or artless and artful to describe the relationship between these movements. If realism subversions were disguised in recognizable forms, as a means to reap the financial benefits of a wide readership, a wide readership it might seek to change from within, and a readership that might not even recognize or notice these subversions at all, then we might say that modernism strives to ensure that its readers will recognize its subversions as subversions, especially subversions in need of attentive reading and rereading. Modernists, in other words, want readers to recognize their experiments as experiments, even if that's all they manage to recognize. <laughs> the experiments of modernist art are perhaps most vivid, nearly immediate, in the music and painting of 20th century Europe. The subversion of form is seemingly all one can hear or see, at first, of course, in the atonalities of Schoenberg, or the cubist geometries of Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque. But British modernism is not known for its experiments in music and painting, at least not until later in the century. Its writers transpose into verse and narrative analogous experiments in juxtaposition, minimization, abstraction, suggestion, and collage, compositional varieties of what one might call modernist selection. In other words, literary techniques of modernist writing tend toward careful yet often dissonant arrangements, arrays, and assemblages. The short stories of James Joyce's Dubliners, for instance, published in 1914, all end upon the precipice of an obscure, unarticulated epiphany. Uh, the Dead might be the most famous example, but many of you who have taught Araby uh, will recognize this as the final sentence of that story. Gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burned with anguish and anger. The only thing a reader knows upon a first reading of this story, the only thing they might know for sure, is that the primary character encounters a potentially life-changing realization here. 
first time readers will probably not feel prepared to understand the intensities with which these stories end. Yet the only way to make sense of the endings is to turn back to the story, to begin again, and to see if one might read it differently. What carefully chosen details, subtle, muted in the narrative, nevertheless begin to resonate with life when one rereads the story, when one knows that this closing intensity is coming. In Eliot's preludes, we see the composition of objects, spaces, figures, and sensations into a tableau, the meaning of which the reader must construct. There is no epiphany here, just the thisness of the arrangement itself. Quote, the winter evening settles down with smell of steaks and passageways, six o'clock. The burnt out ends of smoky days. And now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots and at the corner of the street, a lonely cab horse steams and stamps. And then the lighting of the lamps. The opening sentences of All of Moore's Spleen, published 15 years later, are also exemplary cases of modernist prose. Quote, Go not much will happen, I warn you, right? Goats, it starts with goats though, so that's good. Goats with long purple udders and sly drooping faces past, trailing a strong smell of goat. <laughs> she watched the woman take from her skirt a piece of bread, break a corner and give it to the child, a calm Socratic child with stony eyes, and return to her business of bringing her stick down sharply across the undulating hindquarters of her goats, undulating slowly over the long Saracen road their heavy purple udders swinging pendulously to the bleeding of their neck bells. How well she knew it all. Morning and evening had seen them pass, the same woman with angry pointed cries, the same stick, the same blows, possibly the same petticoats, the same children grown to grandchildren, the same goats perpetually renewing themselves, replaced, undulating, docile, the same purple udders, the same golden satyr eye half closed, the same acrid smell of goats passing, semicolon. And 22 years had made it hardly more real to her than on the morning on which, leaning out on the ship's rail, her eyes set to the horizon, she had, excuse me, seen the island. The techniques like minimiz minimization or suggestion often connote narrative or syntactic brevity. Moore's method of selection here, right, goats, udders, undulating, a catalog of senses and samenesses, exemplifies the morphology of modernist syntax the sort of syntax that, what might, that might train someone to follow the ins and outs and the twists and turns of Derridian or Lacanian prose. Indeed, such syntax inspires rereading, so that one might, as I do here on your left, obsessively track repetitions of words, the integrity of subject-predicate relations, the entrance and exit of embedded phrases, signs of time and place, where and when are we, after all? Signs of a focalizing character whose mind and story begin to come into focus midway through a sensuously dense, image-rich, temporally ambiguous, windingly Ophidian sentence. To repeat my claim from a few minutes ago, modernist writing presents its experiments as experiments. It wants to be clear about its obscurity in which it beckons us to take our time and get to the work of re-reading. Just because more, this is not all of more over here. She looked a little lonely, so this is a page of James Joyce's Ulysses. So I just thought I'd just put that there. But the most extreme example of this double effort to be clear about one's obscurity is not Ulysses, but rather James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, published nine years after all of more. Here's the first page, which I will read to you. I'm going to read a lot of stuff, but you'll hear in just a second why it's, anyway, you'll hear. And that is the first word, by the way. That's not a typo. River run past even Adams from swoop of shore to bend of bay brings us by a commodious beacus of recirculation back to House Castle and environs. Sir Tristram, Villa de Mores, from the short sea, and passing for we arrived from North America on this side the scraggy isthmus of Europe Minor to wield or fight this peninsula at war. Nor had top soil's rocks by the stream of Connie exaggerated themselves to Lawrence County's gorgeous while they went to Dublin, their mumper, all the time. Nor a voice from a fire bellowed, Mish, Mish, to Toth Toth, Lord Patrick, 
Not yet, though, very soon after, had a kid's cat but ended the bland old Isaac. Not yet, though, all's fair in fantasy, were saucy cesters wroth with torn Maffandro. Lots of Peckapah's mouth had gem or shan brewed by arc light, and Rory ends with a regin brow was to be seen ringsome on the aqua face. The fall. <laughs> ba 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 dal gara taka minner ron ton bron ton toner ron tu on thun tro va hon on stan thu hu hu and den and thor nook of a once wall straight old par is retailed early in bed and later on life down through all Christian minstrelsy. The great fall of the off wall entailed at such short notice. That's actually apropos, I think. Uh, they're all such nervous. The shoot of Finnegan, air solid man that the Humpty Hill had of himself, promptly sends an inquiring one well to the western quest of his Tumpty Tum toes. And, and there are upturned pike pointing places at the knockouts in the park where oranges have been laid to rust upon the green since Devlin's first loved Livy. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, there are 616 more pages of that. And this, this is a comparatively easy page uh, of this book. I'm not going to develop a close reading of it right now, although I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A if people are curious. Uh, I simply want to suggest that it, the difficulty of Finnegan's Wake exemplifies, you know, like extremely, like, there's not, I, I don't think there's anything harder than Finnegan's Wake, right? It exemplifies an important quality of the clear yet obscure experimentalism of high modernism, namely the alienation between writers and the mass public, you may have felt that just a few minutes ago, seconds ago, between language and meaning, but also between the perceived economic and social stability of Victorian and Edwardian England, and the sense of an unstable world emerging in philosophy and science and anthropology and comparative religion, a world of interior, microscopic, unobservable, and unconscious regions, a world of increasingly strange and multiple dimensions, of deep time and deep space, an alien and alienating world of fragments that refuse to cohere no matter how hard all the king's horses and all the king's men try to put the world back together again. You see it highlighted important parts. Okay. That's as close as you're getting. In a sense, Finnegan's Wake is at the extreme end of the sort of literature one might expect emerging in the wake of Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, and Frederick Nietzsche from a literature that shares cultural and intellectual space with Max Weber, Henri Bergson, Sigmund Freud, and Albert Einstein. They're all contemporaries, after all, of these writers. Though one could and many have studied modernist literature in conversation with and in the context of these figures and corresponding intellectual and social developments. For the rest of this lecture, I want to focus on the ways in which modernist writers, especially those producing the most experimental work in and around 1922, respond to one of the most alienating and fragmenting events of the last century, World War I. This literature is deeply engaged with questions of how to write, think, and feel in the face, in the teeth, or in the aftermath of a war that should have been unthinkable. And most of these writers would continue to work through the 1920s and 1930s meaning that they remain sensitive to the signs and actualities of an unthinkable war that was about to start up again. Part two, two war poems. Before turning to modernism in the world wars, however, I can't really help, since I have such a golden voice, uh, help but share two poems penned by soldiers who did not survive the first world war. The first is Rupert Brooks, The Dead. Quote, Blow out, you bugles, over the rich dead. There's none of these so lonely and poor of old, but dying has made us rarer gifts than gold. These, these dead, laid the world away, poured out the red sweet wine of youth, gave up the years to be of work and joy, and that unhoped serene that men call age. And those who would have been, their sons, they gave their immortality. Blow, bugles, blow. They brought us for our dearth, holiness, lacked so long, and love, and pain. Honor has come back as a king to earth and paid his subjects with a royal wage. And nobleness walks in our ways again, and we have come into our heritage. 
This poem was read from the pulpit of St. Paul's Cathedral in London on Easter Sunday, 1915. It expresses a delight in glory, a heroic passion, or sorry, it expresses this poem, a delight in glory, a heroic passion for the physical fight, and a patriotic zeal in the willingness to die for a transparently great cause. Its romanticization of youthful sacrifice is perhaps a necessary sublimation for a generation of parents sending off a generation of sons to be cut up by the technologies of modern warfare. The posthumous collection of poetry in which this poem appears, 1914 and other poems published in 1915, meaning that Rupert Brooke was di died weeks or months after he wrote this poem, that this book would become a bestseller and would continue to be even after the war. You can't read it. I'm not entirely sure what year this printing is, but it boasts at the top um, 125,000 copies sold since June 1915. Uh, and that seems rather significant uh, in, in just uh, probably about a decade or so, or a little over a decade in print. The second poem, Wilfred Owen's Dolce et Decorum Est, was written in 1917, but not published until 1920. Given the tone of the propaganda posters I showed a few minutes ago, uh, and the sort of uh, tone of Brooks's poem, you'll understand the delay. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock need, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on, blood shod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys. An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drown. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the wide eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cut of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, dulce et decorum est, propatria. Mori. There's a good deal to admire formally about this poem, especially the modulation of complex and simple syntax, the play of enjambment and caesura, the punctuation that mimics the marching of anesthetized soldiers, the variation in stanza lengths, the vivid and ambiguous similes, the final line which stops short, refusing to complete itself. Though it is never, as far as I know, anthologized as a modernist poem, Dolce et Decorum Est does exhibit the qualities, tones, and attitudes of Owen's more experimental contemporaries, most of whom, probably all of whom, he never had an opportunity to meet. The sudden jump cuts from the dull marching to the sudden attack, to the repeated dreams, to the direct address, to the jarring similes, in fact, even the um, ellipses in stanza two, are reminiscent of the nearly contemporaneous The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. This color coding doesn't quite work the way I want it to. It's a little forced, but regardless, uh, this is the first stanza. This is a uh, canonical poem by, <coughs> by T.S. Eliot. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, or the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. But of course, 
Adultery at the core mass was most famous for its refusal to heroicize the sacrifice of the young, as Brooke, Brooke's work does. Whether or not one could call this an anti-war poem, Owen is clearly a provocateur and a subversive pedagogue, teaching his readers to refuse to take part in the coercive rearrangement of youthful desires. Yet while it is clear what one should not do, according to this poem, lie with enthusiasm to children, what should one tell them instead? And how? The modernist literature of Britain, at its height, between and during the world wars, offers us, I think, examples of what one can say instead. And moreover, how? Part three, Virginia Woolf on war. By the end of World War I, the British Empire lost nearly one million soldiers. A fraction of the eight million military deaths among Austrian, Hungarian, German, Turkish, Bulgarian, French, Russian, Italian, and American forces. As daunting as this figure, uh, as, as a figure like this is, even when we add 10 million civilian deaths, World War II would not be outdone. It stands, as far as I know, as the single most devastating war in recorded human history, amassing 60 million plus dead, wounded, and missing. And it's a conservative estimate. Indeed, the sheer quantity of these losses explains the recurring figure of the returned and wounded soldier in modernist literature and the, pop and the popularity of soldier memoirs throughout the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. And it might also help explain the ongoing interest that contemporary writers have in, uh, in the world wars. One thinks of Anthony Doerr's recent novel, All the Light You Cannot See, certainly Pat Barker's Regeneration Trilogy, Chris Cleave's newest novel. Um, right, we could probably all rifle off uh, quite a few more. In the writings of Virginia Woolf, one finds a literature that seeks to assess, demonstrate, and critique un- or under-acknowledged pleasures and pains, including the ongoing wounds, social and psychical, of the Great War, and the mindsets, attitudes, and institutions which cultivate and perpetuate what she will later call the fighting instinct or subconscious Hitlerism. The critical ambition of Mrs. Dalloway, for instance, which was lost on Hugh Kenner, one of the most attentive readers of Joyce and Ezra Pound, is quite clear to Wolf. In her 1923 diary, she writes, quote, I want to give life and death, sanity and insanity. I want to criticize the social system and show it at work at its most intense, end quote. She achieves this ambition through one of the most striking juxtapositions in modernist literature, the doubling of 52-year-old Clarissa Dalloway wife of a minister of parliament and professional party host, with 30-year-old Septimus Smith, a veteran of the Great War, suffering from shell shock. Rather than doubles, these two strangers, which actually, who actually never meet each other in the novel, might initially seem like foils. Early on, after all, as Clarissa goes to buy flowers for her party later that night, a mere page or two into the novel, she's struck by how one sees life in London so vividly <laughs> making it up, building it round one, tumbling it, creating it every moment afresh. In people's eyes, she continues, in the swing, tramp, and trudge, in the bellow and the uproar, the carriages, motor cars, omnibuses, vans, sandwichmen, shuffling and swinging, brass bands, barrel organs, in the triumph and the jingle and the strange high singing of some aeroplane overhead was what she loved, life, London, this moment of June. For it was the middle of June. The war was over except for someone like Mrs. Foxcraft, Croft, excuse me, at the embassy last night, eating her heart out because that nice boy was killed, and now the old manor house must go to a cousin, or Lady Bexborough, who opened a bazaar, they said, with a telegram in her hand, John, her favorite, killed. But it was over. Thank heaven, over. It was June. You might sense here the understated commentary of an ironic narrator preparing the ground for an opposition which will show us that the war is not, in effect, over. That the trace and impressions of war are, like the hours of this passing day in June, irrevocable. And 10 pages later, we drop, but briefly, into another life of Septimus Warren Smith, who finds himself arrested by the sound of a backfiring motor car. Quote, 
Everything had come to a standstill. The throb of the motor engines sounded like a pulse irregularly drumming through an entire body. The sun became extraordinarily hot because the motor car had stopped outside Mulberry's shop window. Old ladies on the tops of omnibuses spread their black parasols. Here a green, here a red parasol opened with a little pop. And there the motor car stood with drawn, bl drawn blinds and upon them a curious pattern like a tree, Septimus thought and this gradual drawing together of everything to one center before his eyes, as if some horror had come almost to the surface and was about to burst into flames, terrified him. The world wavered and quivered and threatened to burst into flames. It was I who am blocking the way, he thought. Was he not being looked at and pointed at? Was he not waited there, rooted to the pavement for a purpose? But for what purpose? The more time we readers spend with Septimus, the more the world itself wavers and quivers and flames. The more the mass amnesia of London begins to appear precarious. As we learn how to follow the novel between present and past, to and fro from character to character, we learn that Septimus has threatened more than once to commit suicide. That the doctor of the Smiths C dismisses the seriousness of these threats that Septimus has been told, as it were, to man up, that he is haunted by the ghost of his dead friend, potentially his lover, Evans. But when he enlisted for the war enthusiastically, it was to defend, quote, an England which consisted in almost entirely of Shakespeare's plays, and Miss Isabel Pohl in a green dress walking in a square, end quote. That he married young Rusia Smith in Italy after Evans' death, because, quote, the panic was on him. He could not feel, end quote. But the cruel irony of the novel is that Septimus's purpose is to feel what those around him cannot. That a world that would send him and his Evans off to war, only to be killed like Wilfred Owen, quote, just before the armistice, end quote. That such a world is unlivable and unlovable. One cannot he will go on to think while biding his time in Regent's Park before a pointless meeting with a psychologist. One cannot bring children into a world like this. One cannot perpetuate suffering or increase the breed of these lustful animals who have no lasting emotions, but only whims and vanities eddying them now this way, now that. And before he leaps to his death near the end of the novel, he feels he did not want to die. Life, as Clarissa mused at the beginning of the novel, was good. The sun, as he felt when he was arrested by the traffic early in the novel, was hot. Only human beings. What did they want? This presentation of this single day in June culminates in Clarissa's party, during which she hears the news that a young man has killed himself. After she hears of this suicide, she shelters herself away from the noise of her party, at which people she has known all her life, but not seen in years, are in attendance. And she reflects, quote, she had once thrown a shilling into the serpentine. She does this on page nine of the novel, or thinks of this on page nine of the novel. Never anything more. But he, this young man, had flung it away. They went on living. She would have to go back. The rooms were still crowded. People kept on coming. They, all day she had been thinking of Burton, of Peter, of Sally. They would grow old. A thing there was that mattered. A thing wreathed about with chatter, defaced, obscured in her own life, let drop every day in corruption, lies, chatter. This he had preserved. Death was defiance. Death was an attempt to communicate, people feeling the impossibility of reaching the center which mystically evaded them. Closeness drew apart, rapture faded, one was alone. There was an embrace in death. But this young man who had killed himself, had he plunged, holding his treasure? While students and scholars often worry over the degree to which Clarissa is appropriating here, Septimus's death as a sign that encourages her to live. She need not die today, for a young man has already given himself up. We think back to the Brook poem. The text also shows that Clarissa knows and surmises more than Septimus's doctors, more than those struggling not to look at him as he suffers publicly under his hallucinations. Why he did it, why he threw it away, 
to speak, to be heard in a city so content, thank heaven, to celebrate that the war was over. Mrs. Dalloway is not the only Wolf novel to engage with the war. And all of Wolf's work from Jacob's Room and on engages in one way or another with it, even if indirectly. This task that she takes up again and again comes to its greatest theoretical expression in her ethical feminist treatise, Three Guineas, published in 1938. A work of what we might now call creative nonfiction, which presents itself as a series of letters responding to the question, how, in your opinion, are we to prevent war? Wolf's answer, to put it really briefly, develops an account of social, historical, and political complicity between the growing and growling fascism of Germany and Italy with the long history of patriarchal and imperial violence that trains up aggressive and competitive young men ardent for some desperate glory. Near the end of this work, she writes, quote, as this letter has gone on, adding fact to fact, another picture has imposed itself upon the foreground. It is the figure of a man. Some, some say, others deny, that he is man himself, the quintessence of virility, the perfect type of which all the others are imperfect adumbrations. He is a man, certainly. His eyes are glazed, his eyes glare, his body, which is braced in an unnatural position, is tightly cased in a uniform. Upon the breast of that uniform are sewn several medals and other mystic symbols. His hand is upon a sword, and behind him lie ruined houses and dead bodies, men, women, and children. But we have not laid that picture before you in order to excite once more the sterile emotion of hate. On the contrary, it is in order to release other emotions, such as the human figure, even thus crudely in a colored photograph, arouses in us who are human beings. For it suggests a connection, and for us a very important connection. It suggests that the public and the private worlds are inseparably connected, that the tyrannies and servilities of the one are the tyrannies and the servilities of the other. If the human figure in a photograph suggests other and more complex emotions, it suggests that we cannot dissociate ourselves from that figure, but are ourselves that figure. It suggests that we are not passive spectators doomed to unresisting obedience, but by our thoughts and actions can ourselves change that figure. But how change that figure of human being, the one that frightened Septimus Smith, that suffocated him. How counter the old lie which continues to be told to children ardent for some desperate glory. How do we, as Wolf will put it in an even later essay, think peace into existence? For Wolf, what she calls the mental fight means thinking against the current, not with it. It means a life engaged with helping others and oneself to access creative feeling. This task, a writer's task, and a teacher's task, compels her to find alternative ways to make worlds in her novels, to access and alter our perspective on the world in her essays, and to defend the mental agility one develops in reading and rereading the hearts and minds of others. Not all modernists share this project with Wolf. But their experiments nevertheless compel us, I would contend, to find our own way to read and think against the current. I know I'm at 40 minutes, but I have a very fast epilogue that will explain my title. Can I go through it, if people mind? On Sunday, the 9th of June, 1940, less than a year after the outbreak of World War II, and five days before the fall of Paris to German forces, Virginia Woolf, in her home in Sussex, wrote in her diary, I will continue, but can I? The pressure of this battle wipes out London pretty quick, a gritting day. A sample of my present mood, I reflect, capitulation will mean all Jews to be given up, concentration camps, so to our garage. That's behind the correcting Roger, playing bowls. One taps any source of comfort. But today, the line is bulging. Last night, airplanes, German, over? Shafts of light following. I papered my windows. Another reflection. I don't want to go to bed at midday. This refers to the garage. 
What we dread, it's no exaggeration, is news that the French government have left Paris, a kind of growl behind the cuckoo and the other birds, a furnace behind the sky. It struck me that one curious feeling is that the writing eye has vanished. No audience, no echo. That's part of one's death. Not altogether serious, for I correct Roger, send finally, I hope, tomorrow, and could finish Poins Hall, but it is a fact, this disparition of an echo. I will quickly clarify a few things about this entry in order to help us resonate with this curious feeling. First, the garage refers to a plan of Leonard and Virginia Woolf to asphyxiate themselves should Britain lose the war to Germany. Roger refers to her book, published six or seven weeks later, Roger Fry, a biography. Unlike Orlando, a biography, it actually is a work of life writing. The chronicle of a friend and mentor and public educator. Poins Hall refers to an early draft of Between the Acts, which would be Wolfe's last, in fact, her posthumously published novel. It seems significant that Wolfe sets up in this entry an opposition between her writing projects and the war, suggesting that the key to continuing to live is not simply victory over Germany, but her work. She feels, as she puts it in her unfinished memoir, which she was working on around this time, quote, that by writing she is doing what is far more necessary than anything else, unquote. And this war, which also haunts the pages of that memoir, challenges this, continuous not this continuance not only with the threat of bombs, but moreover with the destruction of an audience, the people for and to whom Wolf writes, the echo against which she might sense the efficacy, the purposiveness, and the potential work that her work might accomplish in the future. The death Wolf senses, the death of the writing eye, is occurring because the receivers of the world seem out of tune, too damaged by anxiety, depression, patriotic fervor, nationalism, colonialism, racism, sexism, and homophobia to even attend to her modernist subversions, provocations, perversions, and critiques. Whether or not this evaporation, this disparition of the sense of an audience contributed to her own decision to end her life, in March 1941, I feel compelled in my own research and in my own teaching to ensure that this echo does not disappear, but that it stays alive in our own mental fights here and now. Thank you.